Hello and welcome. This is a webinar about deep brain stimulation. And uh, my name is Patrick Brunden. I am at the Van Andel Institute in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and I will be the moderator. And I'm very glad I have an outstanding panel of participants who will help answer questions and uh, have a vibrant discussion, I hope, about deep brain stimulation. Before we quite go there and introduce them, I would like to start by saying this has all been made possible by Cure Parkinson's in the UK, Journal of Parkinson's Disease, and Van Andel Institute. Uh, I am going to tell you soon exactly how you, who are listening in your homes, can pose questions and, and uh, join the discussion. But uh, before I do this, I just want to let you know who's on the panel, and I'm going to have them introduce themselves. Let me start in my top, top left-hand corner on my screen. It's Helen. Tell us who you are and what you do. Hello, I'm, my name is Helen Bronte Stewart. I'm the Johnny Cahill Family Professor of Neurology and Neurological Sciences at Stanford University. I'm a movement disorders neurologist and my research involves uh, discovering and investigating the underlying neurophysiological signals in the subthalamic nucleus, which pertain to motor problems in Parkinson's disease. I'm very involved in deep brain stimulation and now something called adaptive or closed loop deep brain stimulation. And I'm really happy to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Helen. That's excellent. And then I have on my screen, close to Helen, David. Tell us about yourself, David. I think you're muted, David. I always want to say I think you're muted in every He's webinar. I think that. So yeah, my name is David Ashford Jones. I'm a patient who was a recipient of a deep brain stimulation in 2020, uh, March the 11th, at a, a subthalamic nuclei um, procedure, and I'm here to share my experiences and uh, how I prepared and what to do about it. Thank you so much, David. And uh, next to David, I have Aaron. Hi, my name is Aaron Giddis, and I'm a professor of biology and neuroscience at Carnegie Mellon University, which is in Pennsylvania in the United States. Um, I'm a basic researcher. My lab studies the kind of nuts and bolts of brain circuits that are involved in Parkinson's disease. We use preclinical models, mostly mice, to ask these questions. And uh, we really kind of want to understand if we learn more about the basic science of the brain, how can we translate discoveries we make in the research lab into practice that can be, um, uh, that can improve patients' lives in the clinic. Thank you, Aaron. And finally, our last participant is Tom. Hi, Patrick. Thank you for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. I'm a movement disorders neurologist from the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery in London. My job is half clinical and half academic, and my mission is to improve the, the existing and develop new treatments for patients with Parkinson's disease. Thank you, Tom. So an outstanding panel in three different time zones, I realized just now. So we have quite a time difference between the different participants. Well, how will you be able to participate as someone, someone who's listening in? You have the option to pose questions, and there is a little Q&A symbol at the bottom of your Zoom program. If you click on that, you will see a window pops up where you can type in your questions. We have help behind the scenes. There's somebody who's going to help us group these questions and uh, help us to highlight those that are, are frequently occurring amongst the people listening. So you can ask at any time, almost anything you want. We will try to focus on those questions that apply to many people who are listening in. And uh, we're going to start a little bit about the history of deep brain stimulation, because of course it's a fascinating medical discovery. And the two people who led the discovery and the development of deep brain stimulation were awarded the uh, Alaska DeBakey Award, which is sort of the American version of the Nobel Prize for clinical research about seven years ago, I think. 
so you have to understand this is a major major discovery uh, and uh, you know perhaps helen you could start briefly by saying what is deep brain stimulation and a couple of words about how this discovery came about absolutely um, sometimes I like to talk about deep brain stimulation in the context of a uh, cardiac pacemaker. So we can call deep brain stimulation a, a brain, a type of brain pacemaker. And the reason it's called deep brain stimulation is that the stimulating leads or electrodes are very carefully implanted in these deep brain structures, which Patrick just talked about the basal ganglia. So that means the deep gray matter in the brain. So by chronically implanting these stimulating electrodes and then attaching them to a pacemaker, looks just like a cardiac pacemaker that's implanted under the skin in the chest, and it, for, it that is the battery. Um, currently, people receive continuous electrical stimulation in the, these deep structures in their brain. So it's very akin to a brain pacemaker. And we'll, we'll get a little bit uh, more into the detail of that later when we talk about um, the fact that it's not completely like the, the current cardiac pacemakers, but we're going in, in that direction. So I think, how did this start? I think one of the most interesting things is that there's sort of a parallel um, process going on, as, as Patrick said, Malin DeLong, maybe Patrick, you could give one of your insights about what uh, Malin said when he very first started what was gonna be his amazing discovery. Yes, I heard him, uh gave a presentation when he and the other discoverer, Alim Louis Ben Abid, received the Lasker de Baker Award. And Malon DeLong said that the project he was assigned, which ended up with a discovery of deep brain stimulation, wasn't really a project he was super keen on. So he wanted to work on a different part of the brain, but this was the one he was assigned. And I think it illustrates that sometimes in science, things come about with an element of serendipity and the wisdom and the greatness of the scientist is related to actually being able to see something very, very important in, in uh, a lot of dis, uh, data or, or observations. And, and that is what Melon DeLong did. And maybe, Tom, you, you also know this history. If you want, together with Helen, want to describe how Melon DeLong's observations in animals then led to uh, clinical observations headed up by Dr. Benabid. So yes, I'd, I'd love to add to, to the story. I've worked closely with Patricia Limousin over many years, who was part of the, the team in Grenoble where modern deep brain stimulation was born. And the, the success of it is, is largely because of a very close working relationship between functional neurosurgeons, so, so Ben Abid, and um, neurologists, so Pierre Pollack and Patricia Limousin, who precisely placed electrodes into nuclei within the brain and then very carefully performed programming to assess the, the, the positive and negative effects. And they wrote up their observations um, in papers in, in the 90s, which built upon the observations that had been seen in, in uh, monkeys that had had um, equivalent subthalamic nucleus deep brain stimulation in the few years before. And it was um, the careful observations that, that made it very obvious to everybody that, that looked that a patient off stimulation compared with on stimulation, there were such dramatic changes that it became readily and quickly accepted that this was a, a revolutionary treatment for Parkinson's disease. And it was only um, quite a number of years later that there were randomized controlled trials to assess the, 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 um, the extent of the benefits of deep brain stimulation, because it was so obvious that, that when you switch the stimulation on or off, um, you know, how profound the effects um, are. And we've learned a lot over the, the years about um, many aspects we're going to discuss today in terms of patient selection, the, the precision of, sort of placement within different nuclei within the brain and the programming parameters and, and the different types of indications for surgery um, that, that, that is, makes the, the, the field of such great interest. There's, there's another aspect that I think is really amazing. And Malin um, used to talk about this when he talked about what it was like to record uh, how the neurons are firing in these regions. But um, Malin and a lot of other people's work led to this uh, discovery that was written up in, in a Trends in Neuroscience paper in 1990 
about how the basal ganglia process different information. And this is in what we call a parallel processing mode where anatomically, the motor circuits or what we call the sensory motor circuits are somewhat segregated from the circuits that mediate cognition or mood. And I think that's really quite an important aspect about the brain is that if these circuits were all mixed up, we couldn't really put these deep brain stimulating electrodes carefully just in the motor circuits because we'd also be affecting the cognitive and the mood circuit. So this was discovering this remarkable aspect about the wiring of the brain that these networks were somewhat se anatomically segregated. And then in order to place the deep brain stimulating lead in there, Malin would say that this is like going from France to Spain to Portugal because they all speak a different language. And that's why, and he was really talking about the pallidum. And this is how you can really, um, in the procedure itself, understand that you're in these sensory motor circuits and not somewhere else. And I, I think that was also sort of one of the reasons why this really intricate surgery is possible and is so helpful. But initially they actually damaged the target region, right? So in the monkeys, the idea was to damage the subthalamic nucleus. And, and uh, I was just reading the words now as we were speaking that what Malon DeLong said when he had been given this research, he, he thought the basal ganglia was uncharted territory and it, I don't think it had very high status in the research laboratory, but everybody wants to work on the cortex where there's beautiful, clear architecture and, and anatomy, but this was what he ended up doing. So it says, I was asked to work on the basal ganglia, a cluster of poorly understood brain structures and to determine their role in the control of bodily movements. And we're very, very fortunate that he accepted that huge challenge and, and that damaging a small set of cells turned out to reverse the symptoms in experimental Parkinson's. So, so we've talked a little bit about the history and that this is an unbelievably large major discovery. And, and when we talk about discovery, we think it's something you do in one day and then the next day it's done. Of course, that's not the case. It's followed by many, many, many years of careful development and improvement of the technology. Are there other conditions that can be treated with deep brain stimulation, Tom? Yes, of course. So I suppose starting with Parkinson's disease, we, we need to just define the different targets that can be useful in helping relieve different symptoms of Parkinson's disease, and then talk about you know, how that has led to other um, conditions that, that have lent themselves to, to um, symptomatic help with, with DVS. So within Parkinson's disease, the, the target that's most commonly used is the subthalamic nucleus, and this helps slowness, stiffness, and tremor of Parkinson's disease when stimulated at high frequency. There are, um, the, the subthalamic nucleus is connected to what the basal ganglia loops. These are loops between the cortex, stratum, pallidum, thalamus, and back to cortex. So these loops are influenced by the subthalamic nucleus, but you can stimulate other parts of the loops, the, the pallidum, the internal pallidum, if you stimulate you know, deep within the internal pallidum, you can relieve dyskinetic movements of Parkinson's disease and allow people to take higher doses of levodopa or more frequent doses of levodopa without experiencing dyskinesia. Or you can stimulate the, the motor thalamus and help the tremor associated with Parkinson's. And these, um, these have been reproduced so many times now that we're getting increasingly confident at trying stimulating these different targets in other indications. So patients who have other forms of tremor and this, this may be essential tremor or patients who have tremor in association with dystonia, they can get benefit from thalamic DBS. Patients that have um, other forms of hyperkinetic movements that can look a bit like levodopa induced dyskinesia, but maybe primary forms of dystonia or career form movements or even hemiballistic movements, they can all be helped by stimulating the, the motor pallidum. And so over the years, our confidence of trying deep brain stimulation for uh, a whole range of different movement disorders has grown and grown, and that the published literature is supporting this with good evidence. And we've even gone slightly out of the, the, the traditional movement disorders 
thinking about more of the neuropsychiatric disorders, and um, particularly the, the, the overlap is Tourette syndrome, which has both a, a movement disorder and a psychiatric um, basis. And it's, it seems increasingly clear that stimulating either the pallidum or in some patients, the thalamus, you can improve the tics in Tourette syndrome, both motor and phonic tics. You can change some of the, the impulsive thoughts or compulsive thoughts um, and obsessions associated with obsessive compulsive disorder by stimulating the ventral capsule or stimulating the, the more limbic parts of the subthalamic nucleus. So our understanding of basal ganglia anatomy, our confidence in the, the safety and precision of electrode placement has opened this up to a, a, a much broader population of patients than, than just the, the narrow group of patients with Parkinson's disease who, who it was first applied to. Thank you. I've even read, of course, and you're aware of this, and perhaps Helen can comment that some people have speculated that one day deep brain stimulation might be used in normal people who have no disease to improve their brain function. Of course, that raises many, many method, medical ethical questions. Do you want to say something about this? Could you become a smarter or happier person through deep brain stimulation, Helen? And what's the problem with that? <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. Um, I think that there are already um, non-invasive cortical stimulation methods that people are using that are, that are consumer-based products. Of course, you know, the access currently with uh, direct access through the brain structures to these deep brain targets, I really think that that is, that is targeted towards um, disorders where we know that there's something wrong in these circuits. So we really talk about circuitopathies right now. And um, I think that, you know, Tom and I are very interested in cog cognitive impairment in Parkinson's disease. And Tom was leading this, one of the earliest studies in actually looking at deep brain stimulation for this. But this is really for people for whom we know that there is some problem and we can maybe have different parameters or do things with deep brain stimulation to help that. I do think it's going to be natural to think that, oh, well, then we can, then we can make the normal situation even better. That may not be the case because you have to think about the basic biology and what we're actually doing to the circuits. So I, I, think, I think please don't go rushing in and having leads stuck in the deep parts of your brain to think you'll be smarter because you could have some major complications and be a lot less smart. Well, uh, the last time I checked, Amazon was not offering a do-it-yourself deep brain stimulation kit. So that's kind of reassuring. It's not out there yet. Um, but of course, that raises so many, many questions. We're going to come back to Parkinson's disease, which is our focus. You've already said something, Tom, about the brain regions that typically are targeted in Parkinson's disease and, and hinted that these are disturbed in Parkinson's disease. And that's why the electrodes are put in there so one can normalize the brain activity. We're going to get into more details on this. Whilst we're doing this, I'm just going to say I'm seeing lots of questions coming up in our Q&A. We're going to return to those questions. Uh, there's somebody who specifically asks, why would one choose the subthalamic nucleus in some patients or the internal globus pallidus in other instances? And perhaps we can come back to this. But uh, first of all, yeah, well, well, maybe, well, let's ask that question. It actually came from John Stanford, who many of you know as a Parkinson advocate and has previously worked as a neuroscientist on the basal ganglia. So Tom and Helen, why sometimes the subthalamic and why sometimes the globus pallidus in terms? I can, I can take, I, I, this is something that's debated a lot. Um, you talked initially, Patrick, about the first modes of therapy, what we call ablative therapy. So this was causing a lesion and a unilateral pallidotomy uh, when well-placed is actually a very, very good treatment of Parkinson's disease. I think one of the reasons that I think the subthalamic nucleus for deep brain stimulation is a good target is because it's smaller. And if you talk about this sensory motor region, there's a debate now about whether you need to be in the nucleus and be able to capture the whole of the sensory motor region. And certainly when I was working with Melon and Jerry for a while, this was sort of the underlying plan when they did pallidotomies was they felt they had to 
lesion as much of the sensory motor region as possible. And if you lesion too small uh, a region in the pallidum, the symptoms came back. And I think we saw that uh, happening again with the early studies and focused ultrasound of the thalamus is if the lesion is too small, you, the symptoms are not controlled for a while. The reason why I think it's a little tougher, or at least it was with these concentric ring electrodes to get that whole region in the GPI is that it's a larger target. But therein people think it's also a more forgiving target in that it's, it's maybe a good target for people with some mild cognitive impairment. So I think we tend to do mostly subthalamic nucleus for deep brain stimulation for Parkinson's disease with the knowledge that we can, with our volume of tissue activated or electric field, we can really encompass those motor circuits running through the subthalamic nucleus. But the studies up to now have really not shown a tremendous difference between the two targets as far as the actual motor outcome and have suggested that there's a slight preference in terms of some aspects of cognitive impairment, no, notably phonemic fluency. Um, I'd be very interested to hear Tom's take on this and, and the UK's kind of outlook. So I'm just going to explain to some listeners, GPI is the globus pallidus internus and phonemic phonemic fluency is what I was unable to do right now, speak fluently. Uh, so, uh, Tom, you're going to tag on here. Could you, whilst you answer uh, or build on Helen's answer, could you also explain how it is possible that lesions, Helen mentioned pallidotomy, which means lesions of the globus pallidus, how can they have similar effects to stimulation? It doesn't make sense if you're not in a neuroscientist. So, so that that's the paradox of the, the basal ganglia, you know, um, rate model that, that Melon de Long um, was, was involved in generating. That that you know you would predict that making a lesion in the pallidum would actually make dyskinesias worse, but in fact it actually makes dyskinesia better, and you can mimic this with deep brain stimulation. So it's very likely that stimulating, um, as we do with deep brain stimulation electrodes, are um, inhibiting nerve cell propagation in, in, in a the similar way to, to making a lesion. And, and, and it's likely that our, the rate model of the basal ganglia circuitry is inaccurate. And what we should be thinking of is a pattern that there's abnormal activity, which is going on in our basal ganglia circuits, which we can come onto in some detail about what types of patterns are seen when you record from these different nuclei. Well, what do you mean by rate model, Tom? That's a fancy concept. So, so the rate model was um, looking at, you know, in the absence of dopamine, you'd have too much firing down one pathway and not enough down another pathway, but that's an inhibiting the next step in the pathway. And that was in turn inhibiting the next step. And people tried carefully to think through, well, if we inhibit an inhibition of an inhibition, that's the same as an excitation. And, and you could work out what you'd expect to happen if you then made a lesion downstream. But, but this isn't what happened. And it's, it's the, the signal which changes. And we're going to hear um, this afternoon about the, the um, different types of synchronized oscillations that, that can be picked up by recorded from the basal ganglia, which is a different pattern of firing, not just a, an increase or a decrease in rate of firing. So going back to how we select you know, um, STN versus GPI as a target, we do see some patients with Parkinson's who respond to levodopa, but they go from being off to on with dyskinesia. There's no happy medium in between. There's no good quality on time. And in those such patients, if you stimulate through the subthalamic nucleus, you may just reproduce the same thing. You change an off situation to a dyskinesic situation, which of course there's no advantage. And in those patients, we'd opt for, for the, the pallidum as a target to obliterate dyskinesia. There's also the group of patients who have got borderline cognition, who we know that SNDBS is at a higher risk and therefore opting for the pallidal target. I think somebody turned off Tom's stimulator. He is frozen. Uh, it's not just on my screen, I believe. So we have lost Tom temporarily. We hope he will come back. 
But in the meantime, I can ask Aaron. So you work, of, of course, in a very small experimental animal in rodents, mice. Are there insights that you can get from these brains, which remarkably have a lot of circuitry in common with us humans, in terms of stimulation versus damage to brain regions? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I've I think I calculated that an entire mouse brain could fit inside a human STN. So the work we do has to be very, very precise. And I think because of that, um, sometimes it's uh, you know un unclear what's going to translate and what's not. Um, but uh, it is really remarkable the um, um, how similar the overall structure of the circuit is across the animal kingdom, really, um, to the to the structure of human basal ganglia. And so that creates really nice experimental models where we can try to figure out, you know, what, is, what are these loops doing? And if you intervene in this part of the loop, what's going to happen versus if you intervene in that part of the loop? And there, there's been, you know, quite a lot of predictive um, power from animal models and things that do end up translating well to the human case. Um, I mean, we found, uh, I'll probably talk about this a little bit later, but some of the research that we've been doing has uh, suggested that if you use, um, you know, kind of a burst pattern of stimulation to DBS rather than kind of leaving it on continuously, you might be able to induce some um, long lasting therapeutic effects that can continue even after you turn stimulation off. And our data suggests that this is gonna work better if you stimulate in the GPI rather than if you stimulate in the STN. That's true for our preclinical studies. And um, I think it will just remain to be seen when this gets tested in, in humans. There's probably gonna be some humans that get this stimulation in the STN, some that get it in the GPI. And if there are different outcomes that could really, I think, um, uh, motivate putting stimulators, uh, putting the leads in one brain area or another. So we're still learning about this circuitry. And um, for those of you who are listening, the subthalamic nucleus and the globus pallidus are very close to each other, highly interconnected, and even uh, manipulating subsets of cells in those two structures can have differences. And Tom, you are back. We're delighted. You asked me in the chat if there was something we missed. We probably missed a piece of your sentence, but I want to ask actually, the thalamus, somebody mentioned this earlier. When do you choose to put a, a stimulator in the thalamus as opposed to the subthalamic nucleus? Is Tom frozen again? Or maybe he's contemplating my question. I think Tom froze again. I'm sorry can, about that. I can, I can, Helen, you go ahead. Absolutely. Yes. Um, so the thalamus, actually, it was interesting in the history. We didn't talk about this. Um, deep brain stimulation was actually first approved for essential tremor in the thalamus. And it's interesting that um, this still is the target for essential tremor. The, the, the circuits um, for Parkinsonian tremor also uh, flow through the thalamus. The big difference for thalamic stimulation for Parkinson's disease is it might be a very good treatment for tremor. Unfortunately, it does not treat the other signs of Parkinson's disease, such as bradykinesia and rigidity. So we tend not to use thalamus if we're treating the person for all aspects of Parkinson's disease. It's an excellent treatment for tremor. And I think as Tom said uh, early on, you know, now that we've seen it's such a good treatment for tremor that people are using it for other syndromes that might have tremor as part of their uh, clinical you know, aspect. And within the thalamus, there's a, a, a target that's sort of in the thalamic nuclei, so in, in the, what you might call a gray matter, but there's a lot of interest now in targets that are in the pathways or the circuits that are coming to the thalamus. And this one of these is the dentato rubrothalamic tract. So there's been some wonderful, what we call DBS connectomic work. And this is looking at uh, functional and tractography imaging to try and see if we can identify where that great spot is for treatment. And one of them for tremor is actually in that fiber pathway. So the thalamus, I think, is, is it used to be, of course, you know, for lesions used for dystonia as well. But I think most people feel that the internal segment of the globus pallidus is probably a, a better target for dystonia. Thank you. So we have, in the first half hour here, learned a little bit about the history of deep brain stimulation, how it was discovered, 
And we also understand that development is still going on, and we're going to hear more about that towards the end of the hour. But we also know that there are at least three main targets, the subthalamic nucleus, the internal segment of the globus pallidus, and in some cases, the thalamus can be a, a valid target. And one can improve motor symptoms. The technique can be used for a variety of other disorders, mostly in the motor sphere, but not exclusively also behavioral disorders. But what can one really expect? And here I want David soon to chime in, but I'd like also the two clinical neurologists to explain what, what would they want to see in a, in a patient after deep brain stimulation. And, and I'd love to hear your personal experience as we discuss this, David. So Tom, we're hoping you can stay with us now. What would you hope to see in a patient where you've put a, an electrode in the subthalamic nucleus or in the globus pallidus? So I don't put electrodes in anybody. My surgical colleagues do. They wouldn't That's forgive a good me point. For, not, for not for not highlighting that, and and you know, that that's that's critical for everyone to realise. So it's a team approach. But in someone who's had um, excellently and safely placed electrodes, um, then what we hope for by by getting their stimulation parameters right is to smooth out their experience throughout the day. So so DBS doesn't help more than levodopa. But if a symptom is re responsive to levodopa, we'd expect it to respond to DBS. And therefore, by improving the off symptoms, the severity of off symptoms, it means that we can also reduce some of the, the, um, the either the dose or the frequency of levodopa administration and change, you know, big on and off fluctuations throughout the day into smoother ripples throughout the day. And, and if in a well-selected patient, that should make a big difference to their function and their quality of life and, and make them very happy. But it is all about realistic expectations. We, we you know, DBS doesn't stop the, um, the progression of Parkinson's. There, there are a host of dopa refractory symptoms that it won't um, um, make any impact on. And there are, um, it, it will help the, the things that respond to, to levodopa. So if that is what um, is important for the patient, then we get very happy um, results after DBS. Alison Anderson has asked a question in the chat. Is there an optimal time to consider DBS as Parkinson's progresses? So, so there's a window of opportunity. And I think the window starts when, when someone is getting um, disability or in, impact on their quality of life despite um, conventional medications. And the window ends when people are disabled by dopa refractory problems that are unlikely to get better with DBS. But it's usually a good number of years between that, that the start of that window of opportunity and the end. And within that, that the timing is, is to be individualized. You know, some people that window is a bit earlier because they may have dopa refractory tremor. And that, that's the exception. If someone has bad tremor that's not responsive to dopa, it might still be responsive to DBS. So sometimes we do see people early on with that dopa refractory tremor. But most people can have little tweaks to medications for, for a number of years and they can think about is DBS the right time for, for them um, or, you know, do, would, would they prefer just to have um, alternative, less invasive procedures? And we, we can usually come to the right decision for the right patient before they, they reach the end of that window of opportunity. David, what made you come to your decision? Uh, in March 2020, and you're still muted, David. Got you there. See the little microphone that's red. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, so, how come you came to this decision? Yeah, I'd reiterate what uh, Thomas said about the choice. In that, it, basically, the quality of life that I had was such that I felt that it was worth taking a more um, aggressive approach to the condition. Now, if I, if I take you back to my case, I was 11 years post diagnosis. I was very dopamine responsive, but it was getting increasingly unpredictable. So the offs were very, very severely off and the ons were kind of more or less normal, which in conversation with Tom and let I must say Tom and his team were excellent. I am actually one of Tom's patients. So we definitely have walked the talk about the discussions about what the possible benefits were. And then I had the discussion with my wife and family about what are the risks that offset it. And I think one of the things you need to think about when you go for it is, 
for me, it's been phenomenal. It has reduced my dopamine intake massively. I'm down from 12 cinnamon a day to two. 24 milligrams of repinol down to eight, no apomorphine, no exenatide. So it's it's been truly revolutionary for me. When Tom says, you know, you get a happy patient, yes, you do. But equally, you've got to be aware that when you go in, you know, I looked at the uh, consent form, you know, there, there are some serious side effects uh, secondly to the surgery if it goes badly wrong. Now, thank God it didn't, and it doesn't very often, but these are all things you have to weigh up against that quality of life. And in my case, it was definitely a decision from the day to day, the unpredictability and the, the size of the arse was becoming prohibitive. So, so could you say a couple of words about the consent form and how this uh, impacted your decision and you know, what side effects were you primarily worried about and which ones did you take so, I mean, in the negative? Talk, so, I mean, the, the biggest concern obviously would be a, an intracerebral hemorrhage, but that's I think less than one percent. So, realistically, it's it's the odds are ninety nine to one against it not happening. So, for me, that was quite easy to accept. I think the biggest challenge and the one that I would struggle with the most to get my head around would be the fact that if it didn't work, so do, 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 do does it feel like it's the last option available to you? And if it doesn't work, how do you deal with that? would probably be a bigger challenge, I think, but it's definitely something that weighed quite heavily with me. And in Thomas of... Doyle, who's, sorry for interrupting you, David, Thomas Doyle, one of our listeners asked specifically, is the DBS procedure painful? What was your experience? I have to say I was astonished. I literally went in at 8.30, got the pre-med in, woke up at about 2.30 in the afternoon with Tom pretty much smiling at me. I was up and walking half an hour later eating tea and a sandwich. Um, this, the paracetamol was sufficient to deal with the pain. I didn't even have to go to any opioids to deal with the pain. Um, I had about 40 or 50 clips in my head, I suppose, which were just kind of uncomfortable more than painful. So it's one of those things where you expect it to be quite painful, but it isn't. The worst part was, I think they do a blunt dissection down your neck to put the pack in your chest. And I don't think that's particularly subtle in the way they do it. And that was the most painful part but just a little bit of bruising, nothing probably worse than I've ever had playing rugby. So a pack, you mean the battery pack, not the six pack? No, definitely not the six pack. Yeah, a battery pack. Just sits in your chest that you have to remember to kind of um, charge every Sunday. But you know, compared to the amount of drugs I was taking before, I just remember to put a, a little transponder around your neck is no problem. So the part where they push the lead under the skin was the most painful part, interesting. Yes, definitely. And uh, you mentioned the fear of, of uh, there being a hemorrhage. Uh, somebody asked in the chat, how do the neurosurgeons, and maybe David, Helen, and Tom, you can all chime in, how do the neurosurgeons know that they're in the right spot? So, so not only that they're in the right spot to get the most significant beneficial effect, but also that they avoid major blood vessels, et cetera. What are the things they use to find the subthalamic so, nucleus, uh, internal think, globus pallets? In that preamble, we were talking about the fact that it's a, a process. So I think I had two or three sessions of MRI. So there was a fairly good 3D map of my brain put together. And then you get the stereotactic cage where they actually set, set the messages. Now, I don't actually recall that being put on. I just woke up with the screw holes in my forehead. But it's it's suffice to say that it's done by some phenomenal people. Yeah, I can I can add to that. Um, they are phenomenal people. Um, so this is it's called you know we call it stereotactic targeting, and uh, we actually use the frameless procedure where you can do this through again a lot of computation and imaging. So the neurosurgeons are very good at um, apologies. Um, they're, very, they're very good at targeting these deep brain structures these days, and it's getting better and better. Um, some people we use what's called microelectrode recording. So we actually also do some very fine electrophysiological recording because we see that these um, targets have specific physiological. Uh, signatures. And again, as we talked about those networks of the motor network versus the cognitive and 
the um, mood network, the, you can actually, the brain actually can tell you where you are. And Mail and Delong used to say, it's like going from France to Spain to Portugal. Every region has a different, um, a different language. And so this is a wonderful way whereby you can make sure that you're in that motor region. Um, these days, the imaging is becoming so good that some people are moving away from that. I really enjoy it because I'm in the operating room with the neurosurgeon. And then we also use wearables and we do quantitative tests of movement before we start, once we've placed the lead and with some intraoperative deep brain stimulation. And it gives us a wonderful uh, reassurance and assurance that the person's going to do well and we've got the lead in the right spot. So there's a, a variety of ways to do this um, and get this lead in, in these you know, it's interesting to hear Varin saying that that how tiny the structures are in the mouse. We think it's tiny in the human. This is about a 160 cubic millimeter structure, and we have to get this lead in one part of it in the subthalamic nucleus. So it's it's a very precise surgery. The neurosurgeons who do this are highly trained to get this in the right spot. And we, if we're lucky to be the neurophysiologists in the operating room with them, we're just sort of the icing on the cake. You mentioned that during the surgery, one can look at potential effects, right, and wake patients. And I believe there are clips on YouTube where you can see patients perform various acts during surgery and even play an instrument, if I'm not mistaken. So lots of interesting things honest, you can learn about the learn. surgery. Sorry, David? No, I, was just, I was quite glad to go under a general anesthetic, to be honest. I can see the patient experience being under general anesthesia must be much more relaxing. Although yes. there are benefits perhaps so, to the clinician. Yeah, to well, follow. So, so when do you see Tom, David? So what happens afterwards? You've had the surgery. So I had the surgery basically almost, well, not, not almost, as soon, as soon as the electrodes were in, I actually stopped going on and off. So I don't know if there was a, an ablative effect of actually having just the electrodes in. Uh, two days after the surgery, I went down and we tested out the different settings which again, it's, it's a bit like, you know, it's a bit like Christmas morning, you go up there stiff and not really being able to move and someone tweaks a couple of things, hits a button and all of a sudden you start moving. And again, you just have to be kind of conscious that some of the, some of the settings are better than others. Some of them can have some negative effects. So I remember one where literally it was like I had a stroke, half my face went up. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a question of just literally playing around then. And it becomes a question of balancing between the different stimulation, left and right, front and back. And then once you've done that, you settle on the best um, set of settings for that time. And then you have to start and actually kind of lay your drugs back over the top of that. Because again, I think it's, it's fair to say that there's a, it's a balance between the surgery and the drugs. It's not just, not just a question mm -hmm. of the surgery on its own. We have a question related to this also. Shane Breslin writes, uh, do the nerve cells get jaded, quote unquote jaded, with a continuous same signal from the impulse generator? Uh, maybe I can ask Aaron to explain what one has learned from mice there and also perhaps ask uh, David, Helen and Tom about the need to come in and reprogram the stimulator perhaps. Aaron, tell us, can nerve cells get jaded? What does that mean? For I think this is a really fantastic question. I think is actually kind of uh, some, something that is at the forefront of DBS research. So we sort of mentioned how one of the problems with the basal ganglia and Parkinson's disease is not so much that the, the brain cells are firing at different speeds, it's that they're firing in the wrong pattern. They kind of go in a different order, they fire in clusters rather than kind of regular um, smooth firing patterns. And this is actually thought to be one of the main ways that DBS works is that it's disrupting these patterns. So I, I think Helen had introduced the concept of a pacemaker for the brain. Um, the problem is we don't know exactly what pattern to make the brain fire in. And that's part of what the basic research in the field of Parkinson's is trying to address. And uh, I, I think it's a really important question when you just kind of continuously stimulate one small part of the brain for years, what are the long-term consequences of that? Um, you know, my understanding as a basic scientist, just kind of, you know, learning from patients that have had DBS from talking with clinicians is that it can be very, very stable for many years. Um, but, you know, maybe we could make the technique better if we can actually kind of 
leverage the fact that we are stimulating the brain. I mean, the, the way that learning occurs in the brain is by neurons changing their firing pattern to encode memories, to you know, learn new movements, to retrain your movements if there's been a problem. And I think this holds a lot of promise for future applications of DBS instead of just kind of blindly stimulating because you know we were historically we were trying to lesion an area found out turns out if you just stimulate and you back off a little bit it somehow it works um, but you know we can do so much better with that now with the tools that we have so can we figure out a way to apply stimulation in a really kind of strategically designed manner to actually start to retrain the brain circuits to recover their old patterns of activity and therefore kind of use DBS as a, as a repair device rather than kind of a, a band-aid that we keep over the circuits. So I think it's, it's a fantastic question. So this is a great introduction to the last 40 minutes of our webinar. What does the future hold? And I'm wanting the panel now to answer the more immediate future. In fact, some of it is already here in terms of adaptive DBS, for example. Um, and what would the future perhaps hold in a more long-term outlook with other ways of changing the brain circuitry and animal experiments. So Helen, what, what is adaptive DBS? Tell us about this and what's closed loop DBS? Yeah, so adaptive DBS and closed loop DBS are used sort of synonymously. Um, but the, the idea of closed loop DBS, we can go back to the cardiac pacemaker and now move to the current cardiac pacemakers can sense the heart's rhythm. And this was first done for bradycardia, so a slow heart rate. And when the, when the system recognized that the heart rate had gone below a certain threshold, the stimulator turned on. In, in Parkinson's disease and other neurological disorders, we have been using deep brain stimulation for the last 30, 40 years in an open loop fashion, meaning um, as Arin was really you know, explaining, the stimulation is on 24 seven at the same parameters and it has no idea what's going on in the underlying brain regions. And something that uh, we'll get to or we can talk about right now is that in order to do closed loop deep brain stimulation, you have to know what signals to use. You know, the brain has to recognize the signals, but it also has to recognize what's normal and what's not normal. So obviously if you had a cardiac pacemaker that turned on when your heart rate was high instead of low, you would be in trouble. So we don't want to feed in or algorithms that do the wrong thing. And so we first need to understand what I call, what are the neural signals relevant to the, what we call the pathophysiology, the disease state or the motor abnormalities. And this gets us to something called the beta rhythm or the beta oscillopathy, which is a disorder of neuronal oscillations. Now I've already called it beta, this is the way we call it in the United States. And of course we call it beta uh, in the UK. Um, and this is a, uh, it's basically that there is a brain arrhythmia going on. So there's, there's an abnormal, uh, exaggerated sort of oscillatory activity in these deep structures. And that has also led to some structures of firing together in these local regions that we call synchrony. So I often talk about this in terms of, you know, if you have normal neural activity, it's like you're in a, one of these say holiday parties and there's a, a hum of a conversation going on, but you can easily hear yourself talk and speak to your neighbor. If you're close to this oscillopathy, it means it's like being in a, in a crowd where they're chanting something over and over again and you can't hear yourself speak because they're saying the same thing over and over again. And what we see is we see in specific frequency, there's neural activity that's sort of dominating everything. What's more important also, I think that Anne Graviel brought up in 2015, was it may not be that it's just that there is this abnormal rhythm because she pointed out, this is a normal rhythm in our brains, but it may be that this is occurring in what we call bursts, in transients of periods of this rhythm and that the longer that the rhythm is bursting, maybe that's the problem. And so adaptive deep brain stimulation not only uses this beta arrhythmia, it detects when the rhythm is present and when it's gone above a certain level. And then it says, okay, stimulation, now I want you to increase your intensity. But we're, what we're also doing is we're looking at, with these new investigative stimulators, we can actually measure 
the duration of that burst. And once it becomes in what we think is the prolonged region, we can do the same thing. So adaptive DBS is of things to know is you have to use them. You can record now these neural signals and that you can record them right on the brain pacemaker. So you don't have to be, you don't have to have externalized leads, which is what we used to have to do. And you can then use that signal once you can figure out what's the abnormal single signal to then guide your deep brain stimulation. So it gets back to something that Arin was talking about is now we don't have this, this on all the time at the same level. We're either adapting it slowly or we're moving it up and down in a sort of trapezoidal fashion, very much like a cardiac pacemaker. And I think that this is gonna be very exciting to see if this actually, first of all, is better. And we have some inclination that there's some things that might be better with adaptive DBS, but also perhaps with this wonderful question about jaded neurons, perhaps this keeps refreshing the system so that the system doesn't become jaded. So um, I know Tom has also lots of things to say about beta oscillation. So I, I'd like to hear that too. So just before we go to Tom, to explain to all the patients listening, you still have a couple of wires implanted in your brain. It's more at the other end where there are modifications. So the way the stimulator is run, it's also reading activity at the same time and adjusting the stimulation according to what it is reading. So it doesn't yes. need a lot of extra wires. But no, the no. beta oscillations, the beta and the beta oscillations, Tom, I find that concept hard to understand. It's a whole group of cells that fire in synchrony. What is it and why is it important? So what we see over the years is patients that have, have done well with DBS may start having worsening of their speech or they may start having freezing episodes during their walking. And when we first saw this, we thought, well, this is just Parkinson's getting worse. You know, this is what happens. DBS doesn't stop Parkinson's getting worse and so be it. But we found that by adjusting the DBS or sometimes even switching the DBS off temporarily, the speech can get better. The freezing episodes can disappear. And it's clear that chronic DBS can sometimes have negative effects on the, the normal physiology of the basal ganglion subthalamic nucleus. So this, this is where having a more sophisticated stimulation delivery, rather than being switched on all the time, it may be useful to have it switched on only as necessary. And as Helen was saying, the, the as necessary bit, we're getting closer and closer to understanding. So these, these beta oscillations, it's when all these nerve cells are firing synchronously, they, they all decide to fire together in this, this, these, these waves of these, these, these synchronized oscillations in a certain frequency. And you know, we, we have these in normal health. You know, when you're at rest, the beta, um, the beta oscillations happen. And when you move, they disappear. So they're a bit like having a break on your movement. When you're planning a movement, they disappear. When you move, they disappear. And then when you stop, they come back. So beta oscillations are part of normal physiology. But when they start bursting inappropriately during a movement, then that is what we see as this, the slowness and stiffness of Parkinson's. And so what we want to do is to sense that abnormal beta burst and then stimulate in response to get rid of it. But then as soon as it's gone away, to switch the DBS off. And then you can prevent the abnormal um, things that can happen in the STN by chronic stimulation being on all the time, things like the slurred speech and the freezing movements. And so it's, it's fine so to be Tom, more... John McAfee asked, will the next generation of the hardware on the outside look different? Are these batteries going to end up being smaller when you have uh, the future generation closed loop DBS? Or maybe it's hard to predict how technology will evolve there, but what do you think? Well, there's all sorts of potential directions. You know, the, the, the sensing ability, being able to pick up these beta bursts, you know, the, 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 the latest generation of, of electrodes can not only um, deliver stimulation, they can sense as well. And then the signal goes back to the pulse generator. It's decoded and interpreted. And then the message to stimulate is, is sent down the same wires. And the wires will become more sophisticated and better at sensing and you know, better at uh, delivering the stimulation to the, the right areas. And the, the processing within the, the, the pulse generators will get better. 
the battery life will become more sophisticated. And if it's not on all the time, it won't need to be as big. Um, you know, might, might not even need to be Im implanted in the chest. You might have a, a cranial pacemaker that can be hidden um, in the scalp. Um, and and that, that's, that's what one, one option. So the, the technology will certainly improve. The message that people need to have is that, you know, at the moment, DBS is, is done slightly differently in different centers, whether it's awake asleep or whether it's image guided or neurophysiology guided. But there is the, the improvement of technology um, that is moving on year on year, but it's all to help the dopa responsive symptoms, the, the slowness, stiffness and tremor. Um, and at the moment, the technology hasn't broken through to the dopa refractory problems that, that re represent disease progression. And, and, and that's, that's something that, that DBS at some point might be able to do, but, but other strategies are necessary as well. So, so we, we won't know that for quite some years. I, I can just say we've had 34 questions. Uh, 22 have been answered, I believe, in the chat by Simon Stott, the Deputy Research Director of Kill Parkinson's. But we could have had another webinar. There are so many interesting questions popping up. We just have a couple of more minutes, three minutes. And I'd like to look even further into the future by asking Aaron, could one in the future, the distant future, use a technology called optogenetics to refine DBS, do you think? What is optogenetics? Sure. So optogenetics is a... a I would, I would describe it as a research tool that has really kind of exploded on the scene of neuroscience. We mentioned the Lasker Prize being awarded to DBS um, uh, several, several years ago. This year's Lasker Prize went to the developers of optogenetics. Um, this refers to a strategy where instead of using electrical stimulation to change the activity of neurons, you can actually deliver um, light sensitive ion channels. So neurons, your brain cells are electrical cells. They communicate by generating electrical signals. And scientists have discovered um, molecules that you can express in neurons so that when you shine a light on them, they'll become electrically active. And so it's become a way of basically turning on and off circuits in the brain with the control of light. So you can do it very rapidly and incredibly precisely using you know, genetic tricks to get these things expressed in the right cells. Um, I think that there are companies in California, po possibly at Stanford, <laughs> that are um, looking into the use of optogenetics and figuring out how these approaches can be translated to humans. I think that there's, that is definitely, I think, still kind of a distant goal because there's a lot of just technical um, challenges to overcome. I think it's already being used effectively in the retina um, to restore sight to, uh, to blind people. So there's some trials that are really exciting. Um, I think where optogenetics is super helpful today, right now in the field of Parkinson's research is on the basic science side of things, because it's really allowed us to understand what are the core underlying circuits? Like what is the minimal circuitry of this disease? And that helps us refine where we know that we need to intervene. Um, if we can find those targets, um, it also allows us to figure out what stage of progression of the disease a given target is gonna be most effective. And then using that, we can then either figure out ways to get optogenetics to work in people or um, something that my lab has done is use insights from optogenetics to then figure out how to tweak DBS to get those same effects. And then the DBS can be used in a much more specific targeted way in humans. So I think that's- What that's a really wonderful way to end, Aaron. This <laughs> is the future, right? So you're talking about something that's more than 10 years down the road, probably clinically, but very, very helpful. In, as an experimental tool. And imagine people not having electrodes, but having optic fibers inserted to the brain through which you can shine light of different colors that will stimulate select populations of cells. The choir that sing in the beta oscillation consists of many different choir members. Maybe you go for the basis of the tenors or whoever you want to accordingly. Thank you, Tom, David, Helen, Aaron, for a great discussion. Thank you for all the people who asked questions. We have lots more. Some of the questions we will answer online tomorrow, probably. And you can listen to this also in a recording on YouTube, I think, by tomorrow. And we look forward to seeing 
everyone again in about three months with a new topic. Suggest topics you want, or if you want to come back to deep brain stimulation, I think it would be a wonderful uh, continued discussion. So thank you, everybody, and have a good day, afternoon, or night, wherever you are. <laughs>